Uh, good morning, everybody. As uh, Patron, as Sean said, of this Hetton Colliery Railway project, I'd like to add my welcome to all of you to this conference, this two-day conference, in fact. Uh, but let me start by paying, uh, echoing Sean's uh, words there, by paying a huge tribute to the team of the trustees who, who've worked tirelessly, really tirelessly, and yet with such obvious enthusiasm and, and relish in, in making sure that this bicentenary celebration achieves the profile that it deserves. Um, this committee, I have to say, a committee of trustees, is one of the finest and the most effective I've ever come across. Uh, and I applaud you all very, very loudly. Uh, you had the presence of mind a while back. I've had several presences of mind, but you had a particular presence of mind a while back to recruit someone, to recruit some help in coordinating your ideas and your, pro your project. And you did so by recruiting Gemma. And one of your promotional slides earlier in the program a few months ago now, uh, you had a, a PowerPoint presentation in which you mentioned that Gemma is a Sega lass. Well, you did well. The best Sega Terry this side you've ever had. Bad joke over, thank you. Um, we're celebrating something big today, ladies and gentlemen, and we must remember that. Um, the design and the build of the first, of the world's first, and let me stress, the world's, the world's first, uh, continuous transport of coal from mine to port occurred here with the Hetton Colliery Railway 200 years ago today. Uh, I suppose it was not of itself uh, a one-off phenomenon, a one-off event. It belongs to a whole series of events, of developments, inventions, improvements, for which our Northeast has often been a world leader. But this is a big one. And I even happened to notice last week when I was in London uh, that King's Cross Station has plaques up now that says it's currently celebrating its 170th anniversary. It all stems from here. Uh, and it plays, and played rather, a major part in the, in, the, in the story of the Industrial Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution is really where great British engineering traditions have their origins, uh, and for which this country, and particularly the Northeast, is, is so uh, renowned. Now, amongst those uh, engineers, uh, we must acknowledge probably the most famous, certainly the most recognized, as being the Stevensons, um, who so quickly capitalized on the success of the Hetton Colliery Ra Ra Railway with the backing from the Pease family, extending the principle to the carriage of passengers rather than to coal. Uh, and in three years' time, we'll be celebrating the bicentennial of Stockton and Darlington. And I'm certain that everyone looks forward to that eagerly confident that under the auspices of the Friends of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, we shall be treated to another great program of events. But as well as Stevenson, um, there are many names specifically associated with the history and the development of coal mining in the Northeast, uh, whose legacy lives on in some way. Um, Bain Tempest, Bode Lyon, Lampton, so on and so forth, the coal-owning families. Large, small, aristocratic, modest, entrepreneurial, um, whose direct link to the mining sector uh, ended with the creation uh, the, these are the, all the owners. It end, ended, of course, with the creation of the National Coal Board in 1947. Uh, one of the names often mentioned is Joycey. Uh, it's a curious name, uh, one that a late cousin of mine has traced back to the 1500s, all over the shop, really, Edinburgh, Nottingham. He, he even claimed at one point that we were sheriffs, uh, the sheriff of Nottingham. Um, I don't know. But different spellings. And it, this is the confusing bit, because I can't, I'm not sure you may be able to see that, but uh, it starts off as being gousy or jousy, um, and it sort of morphs in and out of Joycey. And so you see right at the bottom here, um, oh, I, got, oh, I can't get this clicker. Oh, sorry, I'm going back one. There you go. Right at the bottom there, you can see where I've circled Henry Jowsey, and that's the first instance we get of Joycey, J-O-I-C-E-Y. So it is very confusing. Uh, and it was the case that this spelling wandered about a bit it, right up until the early 19th century, the period that we're talking about today. It makes it hard to track the connections back correctly. And I should say that in, instantly there are many, many people in this room who know far more about the role that the Joyce's played in coal mining in this area and about which Joycey, uh, which Joycey is which um, than I do. I'm only an amateur and, and what I have to say may be common knowledge it may be a half-truth, it may be plain wrong. So uh, therefore I apologize in advance if this 
opening address doesn't quite set the right academic tone or the gravitas that the subject demands. But from what I can see, probably the most enterprising generation of the Joycey family, uh, however you want to spell it, um, was born in the first half of the 1800s. A branch living then in the low fell area of Gateshead, uh, who seemed to have been largely engineers. And in fact, it wasn't until 1911, as uh, John Cook has just reminded me, that the first Lord Joycey, as he had then become, purchased the Hetton Coal Company and brought into being the Lampton, Hetton and Joycey Group, and one of the largest in the world. It's heyday producing 6 million tonnes of coal annually and employing 20,000 people. And yet, I'm quite intrigued by a link between the famous Robson engraving and what I know about the story of my great-grandfather. So this is the Latin Het and Joycey colliery um, things. So we get, this is um, the, uh, uh, the famous uh, Robson engraving. Now, I've pinched this version, shamelessly, from Les Turnbull's editing, uh, when he gave a talk to the Mining Institute. It shows us that the master sinker at Hetton was a George Jowsey. Um, so the, end, the, the genesis of the, of the Joyce's begins in the early 1800s with a James Joycey, born in 1806, the eldest of the sons of that engineering family in Gateshead. Now, it's recorded that this James Joycey, when he grew up, was apprenticed as a young man to a colliery viewer. Where? Hen. When? Well, reckoning that an apprenticeship in those days was when the lad was 15-ish, that sort of age. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we can take his date of birth, 1806. We add 15 years to that. And by the rules of mathematics, we get to 1821. Strange coincidence? I think not. I think James, like many bright men at that time, saw what was happening at Hetton. It was exciting, it was promising, and what they all wanted to be part of it. It was connected to the excitement of the winning of the Hetton Colliery Coal, Stevenson's project, a lot of engineering expertise was needed, it was boom. It was a question, don't go west, young man, go to Hetton, young man. And this is where I definitely need a bit of your help because here we've got this famous engraving and we've got the master sinker as George Jowsey. Now, both George and James are very common first names in the family, very common. Makes, it, makes life complicated. The intricacies of identifying which George or which James we're talking about at any one time, not to mention the vagaries of the spelling, are hard to follow. I'd love to know who this George was. I haven't really traced him down in our tree. Was he even young James's grandfather? Because although James's grandfather is mostly recorded as George Joycey, the way that it's spelled, I spell it J-O-I, there is reference to him having used this spelling. Was he James's grandfather or not? I don't know. But it was certainly due, entirely due to the development of uh, developments here at Hetton that James uh, in particular, and subsequent generations were able to make the career that, laid, that lay before them. Um, I don't know if we can trace anything about young James's apprenticeship here, but he must have done okay, because the next fact we know about him is that by the year 1837, he and a man by the name of Joseph Smith lease coal-bearing land at Tanfield, and they sink a pit. And relatively quickly they opened... Other mines all around Stanley, Beamish. Joseph Smith is replaced by James's younger brother, brothers, I should say, John and Edward. And then in 1863, another James. <laughs> We've got so many Jameses. Another James joins the business. A, a nephew of the first James, age 17, and the son of another brother, George. Confusing, isn't it? This young James, who we better know as the first Baron Joycey of Chester Street, he learned all the aspects of mining from his uncles and quickly. And his talents must have been prodigious because by 1872, at the age of 26, he was appointed the general manager and at 35 he obtained the controlling interest in the rapidly expanding B 
business. And by that point, of course, in the second half of the 1800s, we see the coal fields really expanding as the export trade builds. Now, there are countless others like these two, James's uncle and nephew, all eager to be uh, in on the success and brought about by the new way of extracting coal and the new way of transporting it. And many went on to great success. Uh, Joycey was just one of them. Uh, um, oh, sorry, I'll run that one back. Uh, there he is. Um, at, because he becomes a Liberal MP for Chesterley Street uh, and later on as a Baron Ch uh, Joycey of Chesterley Street in the House of Lords. So it marks him out as being a little bit different uh, because he had a political career there. Now, notice the coat of arms. I don't know whether you are familiar with that coat of arms, but look what's in the center stage there. Black diamonds, picked, and your, um, I think they call them the armorial bearings, the animals, which traditionally are lions, pit ponies. <laughs> because he felt that he's, he owed his career and his uh, success to those little creatures who were working away for him underground. So there is a, if those of you who win the auction tonight to come to visit the Ford Needle, you'll see the original Joycey Pit Pony horses. We've still got the, still got the statues of them. Um, but no, look, this is not a, really a talk about the Joyces itself. It, although in passing, I should say that the first James, that's the, the uncle, didn't marry until late in life, and his youngest son was the John George Joycey, whose name you recognize from the museum in Newcastle and after whom it was named. But my point really is to highlight that what we're celebrating this year and, and today in particular uh, is how this community, this, in, this area, the Northeast, was able to develop so hugely as a result of the engineering, the inventions, the studies, the entrepreneurship of families like the Joyce's and many, many others. They've given us this very, very great legacy. And we must never forget that the technical skills that, of all those involved uh, at Hetton and in this area in general, were taken to develop mining and railway, railway technology across the world. Now, I know how much uh, effort and success uh, has gone into ensuring that the heritage and the legacy of coal mining in this area is not lost. It's been a key fo area of focus for you, the Committee of the Trustees. Uh, be aware, in case you're not, that the Tynanweir Archives and Museums Service have been putting together a so-called box of delights about coal mining for loan to schools. Now these boxes of delight cover many, many topics, but essentially they contain objects, some original, some reproduction, that are relevant to the topic. It might be the Victorians, it might be the Vikings, it might be the Tudors. Um, they're doing one on coal mining. Here are just a couple of quick glimpses of what the coal mining boxes of delight will contain. Um, selected objects uh, and also uh, some uh, material, printed material, uh, including, of course, this famous Ralph Headley's Going Home. Now, the team at Tyne and Weir need a bit of help from you, you experts, because their notes say that one of these gentlemen is carrying a clanny lamp and the other a Geordie lamp. But to their untrained eye, they, they say they look identical. And there's also, so we need a bit of help on which is, the, which is the Clanny and which is the Geordie. There's also, incidentally, a box about Stevenson's in their collection with two puppets, finger puppets, uh, representing father and son. And from somewhere, and nobody's quite sure where, comes the observation that George had a strong Geordie voice and hated speaking in public, and son Robert had an educated voice and loved talking in public. And he, so his dad put him in charge of sales and promotion. Uh, we don't know whether that's true or not. Comments afterwards, please. Um, anyway, the boxes of delights for coal mining uh, will be available on loan to schools in all the Tyne and Weir area next year. Uh, and they hope that the service hopes that it will be particular popu particularly popular here in the East Durham area. So look out for one at a school near you um, or have a word with the school about having these boxes on loan. Now, I must say, I felt it a very, very uh, deep honor and a privilege to be invited to be a patron of HCR 200. I recognize, I think, not just a personal link to the achievements of my great-grandfather and generations before that, 
but also to the role that they and so many others, as I've said, played in this wider development of mining engineering in this area. So the entrepreneurship, the skills leading up to, following on from the building of Hetton, the winning of the coal through the limestone, the development of transport, were incredible. Uh, and their legacy is our heritage and our communities as we know them today. I believe that very firmly. These people took mining and railway technology to the world. And in short, they made the Northeast the great place that it is. We owe them a lot. So it's exactly 200 years to the day since the first shipment of, shipment of coal left Hetton directly for the Staithes uh, at Sunderland to much acclaim. It was a Monday, I believe. Now I find it ironic, perhaps symbolic, I don't know, that almost exactly 200 years after the construction of the Hetton Railway started in the previous year, I think it was in March 1821, the last ship of coal to be loaded with coal, 12,000 tons of it, sailed from the Tyne on the 18th of February 2021. What is it about the 18th? Seems to crop up quite a lot, doesn't it? Uh, the coal on that ship, if I have my facts right, was from the field, from the field house operations at West Rainton, just a few miles from where it all began. And as a press release said at the time of this last shipment, the world moves on from coal. Almost exactly 200 years ago. Um, so, although I have this connection to this young man, James, who was apprenticed at Hetton in 1822, we know that my family's direct connections to the mining side of things here, they lay a few miles away from here. The direct connections didn't happen until Joycey, by then Sir James Joycey MP, purchased Lambton in 1896 and Hetton in 1911. <laughs> Nevertheless, there is another important link to 1822. I, in particular, cannot ignore the fact that the good folk of this area, in meeting here on Monday the 18th of November of 1822, and in celebrating the first direct transport, afterwards repaired, one and all, with 50 guests, to dine at the bridge in Bishop Wearmouth, an establishment run by Miss Jowsey. <laughs> That's the spelling, that, that variation of the spelling does appear to, the, to be the most, one of the most common at that time. She was standing in for her father, Thomas, who had run the establishment for a good few years, but by then was seriously ill. And on the 5th of April, 1823, the Durham County Advertiser carries a notice requesting those who were debtors or creditors to his estate to make contact with Mr. Thomas Ray, the solicitor. And just to reiterate the difficulties of tracing the family, the Time Mercury newspaper at the time records at various points that this said Thomas Jowsey had hosted several sales and auctions at the Bridge Inn, which was the common at the time, but they record him in three different spellings in the space of 18 months. What do you make of it? So as a Joycey, a Jowsey, whatever I am, I don't know, uh, I look forward to continuing the tradition that set by Miss Jowsey tonight uh, when we convene at Holgarth instead of Bishop Wearmouth, and where there will be an auction, which Thomas Jowsey conduct, of which Thomas Jowsey conducted many. What goes around comes around, eh? Uh, so let us uh, get on with the proceedings. That's enough from me. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm looking forward to the, this weekend uh, with, with great enthusiasm. We're about to hear some very important contributions, ladies and gentlemen, from our speakers today and tomorrow morning uh, that explore aspects of this wonderful story in much more detail on a very, very significant weekend. Thank you very much.